Dear friends, uh, a warm welcome from the European Union offices here in Brussels. Uh, this is a new edition of Talking Europe, uh, a series of conversations with leading policy makers from the EU institutions. Uh, this time we are having a conversation up close and personal. And what better person to do that than the Director General for Communications and Chief Spokesperson of the European Parliament, Zom Duk. Zom, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Brussels and uh, we are approaching slowly, slowly the European elections. So we thought it would be interesting to pick your brain a little bit and uh, get a sense of what are the plans of the European Parliament ahead of the European elections. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Uh, indeed, it's quite a sunny day, which is not uh, customary in Brussels, but we are enjoying this a lot and weekend is arriving. And uh, no, thanks for the invitation because uh, um, yes, uh, indeed, you are right. The elections are really, really close now. Uh, as you know, they will take place in June, uh, between the 6th and the 9th of June in the different counties, 27 member states. But uh, we are uh, developing our communication strategy since, I would say, one year now. So we are really now in that in this uh, elections preparation. Indeed. And, you know, the work that uh, Digital Communications does uh, here in Brussels, uh, it really centers around raising awareness on what the European Parliament does every day of the week, every week of the month, uh, not just ahead of the European elections, but also uh, for what is important, for what is on the agenda of the EU. So how are you planning to make citizens aware of that important work uh, ahead of the European elections? Yeah, well, as you say, this is our daily business. It's not just because the elections are arriving. I mean, the mandate the logic mandate that uh, we in the communication services of the European Parliament receive from our authorities is uh, to facilitate contact between the institutions and citizens. And this is something that can be done in many ways, but I would say the, mo the most efficient one is, of course, helping those who inform about what the European Parliament is doing, being the media, traditional media, now through the social media, but also, and maybe we, we, we could discuss this uh, later on, uh, with all kinds of allies, entities, individuals, and so on. Uh, but of course, when the European elections are approaching, we have to reinforce this work in some way. And this is what we are doing now. In fact, our campaign, I don't like too much the word campaign because this is for the politicians, but our communication strategy uh, comes with two main elements uh, that we call... Um, Delivery and democracy, D and D. And now we are fully in the delivery phase, which means that uh, um, our aim now, or most of what we are doing, is reinforcing all those channels that help citizens to understand what the European Parliament is doing uh, and what's the impact of what the European Parliament is doing. And from this point of view, we are, I would say, quite optimistic. If you go uh, to the famous Eurobarometer, in this case the last one, the spring one, 71% of the citizens already say that they, they know, they recognize that what the European Parliament and the European Union are doing comes with an impact in their lives. And this is the main element, because if you recognize that there is an impact, this is probably the strongest motivation to vote. If you think that what happens here, it's uh, in any case, you don't need to care because there is no, uh, let's say, yeah, impact or relationship with your life, you will simply... Uh, avoid or you will simply forget. So this is, this is what we are trying to do now. Uh, this means that we are focusing uh, on the activity of the House in these last uh, two past years, but also what will happen in the next six until April when uh, the last plenary session will take place. There are many topics which are important and which are also very media friendly. And these are the topics that will help us uh, to, to create this uh, movement until the, the European elections. And maybe a couple of figures more, which showed the importance of this, this impact. One is the fact that right now, when you ask uh, people uh, about their interest, the international and the European affairs come third, after the national and the local, but before sports, for example. This didn't happen a couple of years ago. This is, of course, the result of COVID, the result of Brexit, sadly, or the, the result of, of course, the war in Ukraine. And then the last figure, which for me is the most important. Uh, right now, 67% of people say that in case of European elections tomorrow morning, 
they would go and vote. Of course, we know that 67% doesn't mean that all of them then will cast their votes, but we can compare this with the last elections. And in 2018, uh, there were eight points less people saying this. So we see that we are in a kind of uh, increase increasing trend and that's that's positive it is very positive indeed and and i think those that followed a little bit uh, european politics uh, they could see how the campaign you had for a lack of a better term back in 2019 contributed significantly to increasing the turnout and of course since then we live in a different world you mentioned the pandemic uh, war has returned to our continent so you think those factors will um encourage more people to participate. They've seen the reaction of the European Union. They're aware of the work the European Parliament has done to protect our continent from the effects of the pandemic and, of course, to help us react to the invasion of uh, Ukraine. So you think that this could be a contributing factor in uh, increasing the turnout? I think so. Uh, why? Uh, because with all this crisis, in some way, the media normalized the European Parliament. Um, I'm in Brussels since a while now, and I can remember very well the times where uh, media, the journalists, when reporting about the European Parliament, uh, they always started with questions. Is this an important parliament? What they are doing is uh, something which really is important. Um, there was also this discussion about the democratic deficit of the European Union. All these things are behind us. And I think that this is not just because of the Treaty of Lisbon and all the reforms and so on. This is also because during these last years, during this very bumpy legislature, because of all this crisis, the European Parliament and the European Union have become something normal for the media and then normal for the citizens. So if you compare, for example, uh, uh, the media exposure of the Parliament now and five years ago, you will see that we are almost now double than it was uh, the case one year before the previous elections. And if you look for information about the next European elections, there is a lot already in many media. This summer was even amazing in some counties, in France, for example, or in Italy, all these discussions about who will be the head of the list for the European elections happening now and being reported for the 2019 or for the 2014 elections. You had to wait until three, four, five months before the elections to get some reporting about it. Now it's happening because it's also a political story. So yeah, the situation has completely changed. And then of course, and I think that this is even more important, right now making a distinction between the national politics and the European politics is completely ridiculous. It's completely artificial. If you want to discuss about migration, if you want to discuss about uh, industry, if you want to discuss about environment, are you going to try to make a difference between the national policy and the European policy? You cannot. And this is what citizens are understanding. So in some ways, uh, we see the emergence of a European public sphere uh, where the same challenges affect people across the continent and the debate around the possible solution to those challenges is becoming more European than national. And that has an impact also in the visibility of the institution. And you can see that in the surveys. Uh, I mean, again, you can go back to this Eurobarometer or to other surveys, let's call them independent surveys by private uh, companies, and you will see that most of the priorities are the same uh, for citizens living in Sweden or for citizens being in Greece. Of course, there will be differences. And in Greece, they will be maybe more concerned about, I don't know, migration, or maybe now uh, about climate change because of these uh, horrible floods and, 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 the, and the fires during this summer, compared with Sweden, where maybe they will at that point have other necessities. But at the end of the day, when you see the list of priorities, is more or less uh, uh, the same. And then it's true, we can go into a kind of scientific discussion about whether this uh, public opinion, this European public opinion or public sphere exists or not. Uh, I think it's there as at the same time, this is perfectly compatible with uh, being members of a national sphere, a regional sphere or a local sphere, depending on the subject or depending on the moment. Indeed. And you're right. There is a thread that connects, I think, all those different levels of governance because ultimately we need to use those levels of governance. Now, if we 
may explore a little bit more your strategy and uh, the audiences that you're planning to reach out. You know, I'm sure your data and your research has demonstrated which people are more inclined to vote and which are not. Do you have any specific audiences you're planning to focus your resources on because you want to activate them and see them participate in the electoral process more than they have done in the past? Yeah. Well, there we take uh, the lesson of uh, what we were doing in, in 2019. And yes, it was quite successful. Um, of course, we are just mm, a section of the administration of one of the institutions in Brussels, Strasbourg. So uh, we cannot deploy a huge communication campaign and that it's going to uh, connect us with 400 million citizens in a very real way. So we have to make choices. Some choices are about the targeting and some choices are about the way of organizing the campaign. The way of organizing the campaign, and we can discuss this, as I said before, is this must be something completely open in a way. I mean, to be sure that this can be also shared with others. It's not the European Parliament's campaign. We do the ball, but in some way then the game starts. Uh, but at the same time, what we think uh, also uh, it's uh, 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 important is to select those sections of society that will be, let's say, more willing to receive uh, this information or this input from the European Parliament. And there, of course, and I think that this is not a surprise for anybody, we try to uh, mobilize those people that we call the soft abstainers. Those people that in all the surveys will tell you that yes, they will go to vote and then at the end they don't. Why? Uh, for many reasons. Because it's sunny and then they go to the beach or because they simply forget or because they have um, other priorities at that particular moment. This is the people that we need to mobilize. And there is also a second section, I would say in this case more for civic reasons, for public responsibility, which is young people. We know that young people now tend to vote less than average, not just for the European elections, in general, almost in all countries. So yeah, we need to use also the European elections uh, to, uh, to engage with young people, to show them what does it mean a uh, lively democracy and what does it mean participating in the democratic life with a specific challenge uh, created by the fact that in five member states now, uh, the age um, for voting has been lowered, uh, for example, here in Belgium or in Germany, to 16 years old. That's very interesting. May I pick up on the point uh, about young people? Uh, yes. You know, uh, there are challenges there, so it will be interesting to hear what is your approach to engaging younger audiences? Well, since a couple of years now, uh, young people is one of our priorities for the reasons I have I just uh, uh, explained. Uh, which means that uh, we have been able to develop several actions, platforms, products which are focusing uh, only or mainly uh, on young people. Uh, this is uh, the case of our European Youth Event, when we gather more than 10,000 uh, young, young European citizens in Strasbourg uh, every two years. Uh, this is the case of our Euroscholar program. This is the case of our uh, European Parliament Ambassadors School, which helps us to be present also in the schools uh, through the teachers and then, with, of course, with the pupils. Um, this is also, of course, together.eu, uh, what, uh, by the way, was one of the main elements of our, our former campaign, the This Time I'm Voting campaign. This is quite a nice initiative and a very useful one because this allows individuals, in this case, mainly, not only, but again, mainly young people uh, to join the move, to help us with the campaign, to help us with all kind of information, activities and, and events. And this is also one of the strongest ways for us to reach more young people, because of course, uh, through them, through these activists or through these volunteers, it's easier to get people that uh, in another way would be a very difficult uh, uh, target for us. So yeah, now the question, and this is something we are working um, right now on, is how to create coherence uh, around all these uh, activities and how to uh, 
reuse or to utilize these activities uh, mm, to, again, uh, to connect these young people with the democratic responsibility, with this idea that democracy has to be defended every day, but that some days are more important than others. And the day of the elections, being European elections or national, local or others, is really an important day or a key day to defend democracy. Indeed. And you, because we've noticed that there is a certain degree of disengagement among younger audiences with the democratic process. You know, it takes time, it's laborious, and often frustrating. Uh, and as a result, they will either abstain from voting, or they might be tempted to vote for those that offer easy solutions. Vote for me, and I will fix everything with a click of a finger. Have you noticed that trend too? Uh, are you concerned about the fact that young people are getting frustrated with democracy? I mean, I'm personally concerned because, of course, you can see this happening in many countries. Uh, when you look to uh, voting behavior in in several counties, I'm not going now to, to name or name and blame, uh, you can see that uh, the, the, the result sometimes is, uh, is boosted by in the way uh, young people uh, are, are voting. Of course, this cannot be the aim of our campaign because we are addressing uh, everybody. This, I would say, is more in the remit or in the hands of the political parties and the candidates, national political parties, the European political parties. They are those who have to address this uh, problematic. Uh, you can maybe, or you maybe uh, read these last days, uh, several uh, uh, interviews with the president of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola. Uh, she was uh, very uh, clear in some way in uh, sending this kind of message that political parties, and mainly those political parties that consider themselves more or less in the center uh, uh, of the political landscape, uh, need to regain the trust uh, of these uh, uh, people, young people. But again, uh, we as the institution, we have to be uh, helpful. We have to support uh, all those political uh, movements, all those, I would say, even social movements that work for consolidating democracy, uh, including, of course, participation of young people. Indeed. And that actually brings us also to the role of civil society, uh, because Exactly. The European Parliament has a broader remit, but the role of civil society can be a bit more targeted. It can really engage and ensure that uh, um, the voting intentions of young people, but across the board, are very much rooted on democratic principles. In 2019, you had a very open campaign. You engaged very closely civil society organizations, and, and that was felt across the board and it had probably some contribution to the result. How are you planning to work with civil society this time around? Uh, we are not planning. We are already there. I mean, uh, since uh, one year, I would say now, we are in contact with uh, hundreds uh, of organizations, including, of course, the VR movement, which is, uh, I would say, one of our strongest allies in this kind of activities. Uh, and thanks, by the way. Uh, hundreds of organizations here in Brussels, so European or pan-European organizations, but at the same time, hundreds and at the end of the day, thousands of national organizations uh, through the activities of our uh, communication information offices uh, uh, in the member states. And this is essential for us. It's essential during the legislature, but it's even more important now when the European elections are approaching. Again, as I said, we can do many things, but we cannot reach everybody. And by the way, we cannot individualize our strategy. So maybe uh, there will be organizations which are interested strongly interested in environment or in social policies or in migration uh, or in different industrial sectors of activity through these organizations and with a little bit of help of our communication services we can target them or they can target them with a specific content which shows to them that in fact what they are doing or the things they are interested in are connected with European elections and maybe many times more connected with European elections than with the national elections. So for us, this is uh, uh, really essential. And then there is also a question of visibility, because uh, when we will approach the elections a couple of weeks uh, before, uh, it will be important also to create the external visibility to these uh, elections. And there, if you look back to 2019, there were several uh, interesting um, actions promoted by 
even by companies. I'm not going to name them, but uh, it was very nice to see that these companies were joining with emails to uh, to their staff or placing uh, advertising advertisements about European elections uh, in the facade of their buildings in in many cities. So we will try, of course, to repeat this and, and to increase it compared with 2019. And Rob, you mentioned earlier uh, participation and how can we make citizens feel more engaged, like shareholders of what's happening over here. Uh, and we just went through the Conference of Future of Europe. It was an interesting example of participatory democracy at the European level, a unique experience uh, that hasn't been tried before, uh, at least not at the cross-border international level. Uh, how did you view that experience? The Parliament was very much involved in it, it hosted the plenary sessions, members of the European Parliament led a lot of the discussions, and, and I think the citizens also appreciated very much the role that the Parliament played. Do you think this can also contribute a little bit to uh, making Europeans feel that the EU is their own and then be more inclined to vote? I think so, but uh, for this happening, of course, we have to be also able to uh, prove uh, to the citizens that uh, this conference was useful. Uh, and I, this is something that we certainly will do uh, before uh, these next European elections. The conference was very important, and the results of the conference, I would say, were even amazing. It was very difficult to imagine that at the end of a conference, lasting just one year, in still in the middle of COVID with all kinds of difficulties, uh, this body would be able to, uh, to end its work with a meaningful document with hundreds of very concrete proposals. And this happened. And I think that this happened uh, mainly uh, because of this idea of uh, mixing the politicians with, let's call them normal people, citizens that the day before sitting in the hemicycle in the chamber in Strasbourg, they were in their shop, uh, they were in their uh, enterprise, they were at school or they were at home. And then the day after they were discussing about the future of the European Union uh, with uh, very interesting uh, proposals. And now I think again that what it's important is to show to the, to the citizens, to these citizens, that these proposals are being transformed in action. Of course, the main responsibility uh, in this case goes to the European Commission headquarters, but the Parliament is going to make an effort in explaining uh, to the public opinion which of those recommendations are already adopted, uh, which of these recommendations are still, let's say, in the pipeline, but something is happening because the Commission has drafted the proposals, and what are those recommendations that are still there waiting uh, for being transformed in actions? And there, of course, this is also linked to the fact that some of these recommendations uh, need a reform of the treaty. And you know that there is a huge discussion about whether this reform will take place or not, and when the European Parliament is still among them, uh, among, among those who think that this reform is necessary. I would say it's even, uh, a, even compulsory because of en enlargement. And uh, I hope that in a couple of months, uh, we will see in the plenary a debate and a vote about very concrete proposals by the European Parliament to reform the treaty. You won't be surprised that the European movement has been one of those uh, that has been calling for reform, not for the sake of it, but like you said, to make our union fit for purpose in a completely different world than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and it's I think it's worth recognizing the role that the European Parliament has played in that regard. It has been very much at the forefront of that debate and is indeed very welcome. Uh, in your you know, engagement with your communications, you notice a, a distinction and appreciation among citizens between the different institutions, the Commission, the European Parliament, the Council, or the European Council itself. Well, when you go to the surveys, uh, in Historically, this is a trend, and the European Parliament is always more popular than the Commission and, and the Council. This can be explained by the fact that the Parliament is the only institution which is uh, elected by the citizens. Uh, this can also be uh, linked to the fact that the name European Parliament probably is closer to citizens, because there are parliaments in all the member states, 
than commission or council, which are very specific and very, let's say, institutional names. But I don't think that uh, this is important. I mean, at least for me, it doesn't matter if the citizens think that the parliament is more popular than the commission or the commission than the council, because at the end of the day, this is about the European Union and the European Union's image and the European Union's credibility. Uh, there are obviously many fightings in Brussels among the institutions because institu each institution is playing a different role. So they have to fight sometimes as each other. And then, of course, there will be dialogues and dialogues and coordinations and uh, uh, all kind of uh, ways of uh, putting the three institutions together. Uh, but for the citizens, this is not the essential. For the citizens, what is essential is the result. And the result can be positive or negative. And the result can increase or decrease the legitimacy or the, let's say, the, uh, the visibility and uh, of, of the whole uh, European Union. And I think that at the end of the day, this is what is important. Very much so. And, uh, and again, the institutions are playing a crucial role in increasing that visibility, but it really is down to member states um, and what they do in their domain and how they communicate about the EU. And uh, one of the frustrations we have as an organization whose raison d'etre is to promote the idea of European integration is that sometimes uh, people in the capitals tend to nationalize the successes and then Europeanize uh, the challenges. And that makes it a bit harder for people like us to communicate about what exactly the EU does. Uh, one final question, perhaps, uh, looking into the future. You know, and, uh, you know, that's, there's no right or wrong answer here. But if we found ourselves at the same place uh, five years in the future, preparing for the next European elections, what would you consider to be a success of that next European Parliament, that next legislature? What will you see, what will you hope to see happen in those five years? I would say that the success could be measured uh, depending on how far we go in preparing ourselves for enlargement. Uh, because uh, with this enlargement, uh, we need to be really efficient uh, in two ways. Uh, one, uh, in preparing or helping uh, all these candidate states uh, to be ready to join the European Union. And we know that because of geopolitical reasons, this enlargement is necessary, and I would say even in some cases urgent, which by the way is what happened in 2000, because people forgotten that this discussion already took place uh, for uh, the big bang of the enlargement to the Eastern and Central European countries. Same discussion. Uh, and the second is that, of course, this will need a real reform of the way of working uh, for the European institutions, including, of course, the reform of the uh, treaty. And I think that nobody in the European Union uh, can oppose uh, the reality, which is that right now taking uh, decisions in the Council for 27 member states by unanimity in many topics or in many themes where you need uh, very fast decisions, it's almost uh, impossible or it's maybe the best way to slowly kill the European Union. So in five years, I think that the thermometer will be placed exactly uh, in, uh, in this uh, crossing uh, of two uh, reforms, the internal uh, reform to be ready for the enlargement and the external reform, which will, uh, let's say, become this large. Absolutely. And uh, I think uh, I couldn't imagine a, a more visionary way to conclude our conversation because a lot of hinges on those uh, necessary changes. Uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, good luck with your work. It's thank hugely you. important. It already has a positive effect, uh, but you know we are looking forward to continuing our, our collaboration so we can get uh, more Europeans aware about the European elections and more of them taking part actively in it. So good luck to you. We need you and of course we need all people around you, members of the European movement, uh, families, uh, friends, uh, uh, because uh, this is going to be huge, uh, but at the same time, I think that it will be really amazing. Indeed, indeed. And a big thank you to all of you for watching. Uh, please stay tuned on our social media platforms, but also go to europeanmovement.eu uh, for more interesting discussions like this, but also for opportunities to get engaged ahead of the European elections, but also in general. Europe 
is ours. We depend on working with you. Thank you very much.